There's a dividend stock out there that's been on and off of my watch list forever, basically. I've been investing for dividends and cash flow for over 20 years, and this particular stock, it always seems to kind of come on and off of my watch list. And I always have found it historically a little bit too expensive. I found that the starting yield, it was always a little bit too low. And I even found during market corrections that the corrections, it just never seemed to correct enough for me to go ahead and take a position. That being said, a lot of subscribers here on my channel have said that this is actually their favorite dividend stock. It's their number one, their best dividend stock, the one they like the most. And so I thought this would be another great opportunity to revisit 3M Company, ticker symbol MMM. 3M, if you don't know, is a global producer of specialty products, over 55,000 products, including lenses, films, adhesives, commercial products, medical products, consumer products, all kinds of innovative products. And so I want to discuss 3M today. I want to go through it in detail. I want to share that I honestly, I can't believe I don't own this stock by now. It's kind of surprising to me, but that may change in the near future. I am considering taking a position in this company and let's get started. Let's look at 3M company today. So another fun video about dividend growth investing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the questions and the support in the community. I actually just did a video on my favorite stock of all time for dividends. That is Johnson & Johnson. I'll link in the description below. And I asked, I asked a question, hey everyone, what's your favorite stock? And a lot of you came back and said, hey, it's 3M. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe, Ian, I can't believe I don't own this stock. And I want to share with you why I don't own this stock. And I think it's a lesson for myself and everyone else out there. I want to start with a tale of two stocks. And so these two stocks are Procter & Gamble and 3M. You can see a table here at the top, Procter & Gamble on the left, 3M on the right. Procter & Gamble, by the way, I own that stock. It's in my portfolio. I'm averaging in here in 2018. I like this stock. It's at an attractive starting yield right now. And I'll link more in the description below to some more videos about my thoughts on Procter & Gamble. But anyways, I invest for dividends. I intend to um, live off of dividends and to pay my bills from dividends. And so the dividend is everything to me and the stability, the growth of my passive income from dividends. And so I want to look at these two companies from a dividend perspective before doing anything else. Procter & Gamble, it's at 71.81 per share. This is price per share. 3M right now is at $192.99. The dividend for Procter & Gamble is $287. Dividend for 3M is $544. If I take the dividend, I divide by the share price, I get what's called the dividend yield, the current yield. If I buy shares today, that's the yield I'm gonna get in terms of dividends, the starting yield. And the starting yield right now in Procter & Gamble is basically 4%. This is unheard of. This is a fabulous yield on a world-class consumer non-cyclical stock. This is why I'm so attracted to it because I get my 4% right off the bat. With no further dividend increases, I get my 4%. That being said, 3M right now, it's a 2.8, 2.8. 2.8 on the historical side of things is lower for me. Typically when I buy a stock, I like an entry yield, a starting yield, kind of on average in the 3.3% range. Some lower, some higher, but 2.8, it's definitely on the lower end of things. And that's after a correction. 3M is actually corrected plus or minus um, about 25% so far year to date. We'll get more into that later. But after a correct, before the correction, the yield was even lower. And this paints the picture why 3M has never made my portfolio. The starting yield, it has never really matched my expectations. It's never gotten into this territory, at least as, as long as I've been following the stock like Procter & Gamble. It's been, the best I've seen is kind of like this, 2.8. And um, 2.8, it just doesn't do it for me. That said, there's some faultiness in this logic. <laughs> and I, I love catching myself like this, and this is why I do some of these videos, because it helps me look at, look at my own investment strategy. It helps me document my journey and improve over time. And um, this, is, this is interesting. So let's take two more scenarios. Someone who needs the money tomorrow versus someone who needs the money 10 years out. Do I intend to live off of dividends tomorrow? No, I like the possibility of doing that. I like the flexibility of having that liberty to do that if I want to, but I'm not going to do that. Really, it's going to be further out. Let's say like 10 years out, maybe I'll start tapping into my dividends, paying bills with dividends, living off of dividends, or at least supplementing um, my living expenses with dividends. 
if I need the money tomorrow in general, it's going to be advantageous to have the stock with the higher starting yield. Why? I need the yield tomorrow to pay bills. And so something like this looks really attractive. However, if I don't need the money tomorrow, if I'm not going to pay my bills with dividends until, say, 10 years out, the starting yield, it really, it really doesn't matter. I've even done a video on this called Starting Yield Doesn't Matter. I'm going to link in the description below. I did that video for a purpose to, um, to really reinforce the idea in my own mind. Anyways, here's where the magic happens. The five-year dividend growth rate for Procter & Gamble last five years is 20%. The last five years, by contrast, 3M has grown the dividend by 114%. That is quite a difference, 20% versus 114. Let's say that these two companies can keep it up. Let's say five years out, they can do the same thing. If I take a 20% dividend growth on this 287, I get to 344 for Procter & Gamble. If I take the 114% growth rate on their um, 544 for 3M, I come out to 1164. Basically what this means is my yield on cost, my future dividends five years from now projected, divided by my starting price for Procter & Gamble will go from 4% to 4.8. Not bad in five years time. 3M though is going to go from 2.8 to 6.0. This is the difference between a starting a high high starting yield and a lower dividend growth rate versus a low starting yield and a high gr dividend growth rate. Oftentimes companies like 3M they, um, they can confuse dividend investors. They can even confuse investors like myself who have been at this for 20 years because just when someone looks at that starting yield it looks really low. It does not look attractive but when one that's when one is not factoring in the dividend growth rate. When one factors in these astronomical dividend growth rates, the yield on cost can be really high and it can surpass something that has a high starting yield right now. And so this is a lesson to all of us, myself included. I think personally, my own portfolio, it's good to have balance. I like some stocks that have low, lower starting yields, higher growth rates. I like some stocks that bring current yield because I never know. What if I need to tap into my dividend income tomorrow? If I do, I'm sure happy that I have stocks like Procter & Gamble with the 4% starting yield and stocks that are even higher yielders than Procter & Gamble like Southern Company that I've done some videos on, I'll link in the description below, that have an even higher starting yield. But that being said, what if I don't need the dividends tomorrow? What if I want to maximize my yield on cost? It's sure nice to have these types of companies too. And so for me, I own 37 stocks right now. It's a balance. It's a mix of all different types of stocks and each stock plays its own role on the team. But that said, this is why. This is exactly why I've not bought 3M so far. It's always been that that starting yield just didn't do it enough for me. But maybe I should reframe how I look at it. Maybe I should change my logic a bit. Maybe I should be looking not at the top part of the chart, but more at the bottom part of the chart where you can really see that phenomenal yield on cost getting to potentially a 6.0 after only five years from now. That is just phenomenal. And so tale of two stocks, I love this. Anyways, I want to now just jump into 3M. What's 3M all about? What do they do? They are a big global company, $114 billion market cap, and they produce over 55,000 products. 55,000, that's incredible. We've talked here on my channel a bit about Amazon creating a dividend portfolio that's disruption proof. Because the fact of the matter is, is when one builds dividend income, one is going to most likely be living off of dividends, not right away, not tomorrow, but it's going to be decades out. And so one wants to also to achieve a high yield on cost needs companies that will grow the dividend over time, stand the test of time, be around, be stable, in general, disruption proof companies. And so I like to buy companies that are disruption proof. And I think that 3M is a great example of a disruption proof company because how in the heck is Amazon going to come along and disrupt 55,000 products that these guys make, that, they, that they've been making for years, that they have patents on, that they have intellectual property on, things like adhesives, things like films, protective coating, sandpaper, all of these things, even those Scotch-Brite um, sponges that one uses to wash their dishes with. How the heck are all of these things going to be disruptive? Uh, disrupted, I just don't know. And so that's something I like about them. They got the big market cap. They've got the, um, the suite of products. What else about these guys? EPS. As with most stocks I'm analyzing on my channel now, the EPS, if one goes to Yahoo Finance, the earnings per share are completely off because of tax reasons. There's one-time tax, charge, one tax charges. Companies are taking advantage of the new tax code to do a lot of um, uh, changes in, in their accounting and their taxes, in general benefiting these companies. 
However, it throws off the EPS in the short run. When one looks at the projected EPS, though, going forward for 3M, I pulled this off of their latest quarterly report, it comes out to a range of 1020 to 1070. If I take the 1020, I divide the share price by the 1020, I get an, a PE currently of 18.92. It's not great, but it's not bad. What's interesting is this comes after a correction. This thing's already corrected about 25.6%. And so for me, I don't know if 3M is going to get a lot cheaper than this. I certainly think if we have a broad-based market correction, we have a recession hit, we have another great recession maybe, It'll, it'll go more because I looked at the data from the Great Recession and that was actually when I saw 3M dropped about 50% from its peak. So we're only halfway there if, we're, if, we're, if it's gonna drop more. But looking at other corrections along the way, usually this is about all it's done. It's usually only done about 25%. So with a world-class company like this, this may, be, this may be it, it may not, I just don't know. Um, and this is a forward PE, by the way. I did a forward here. I usually don't do a forward, but again, because the tax data was kind of murky and they gave a, a solid projection on this year. So I felt like that was the best available data to back into a PE ratio. But anyways, the, the point here, I don't know if it's a deep value or not at this point. Maybe if it were down at a 15, that would be a real deep value for something like 3M. But at an 18, 19, that's okay. That's a, it's, you know, it's a fair price. Anyways, um, debt, 14 billion. On a company that has a market cap of 114 billion to have only 14 billion in debt, I love this. This is rare. We know that interest rates are going up. We know these companies are gonna have to refinance their debt. We know that that's going to be burdensome to the cash flow, to the earnings of companies in the future. So I like to own companies in general that have lower amounts of debt. Do I own ones that have higher amounts of debt? Yes. There are certain industries like utilities, for example, but it's just characteristic of the industry. And it's something that these companies live with. But even within utilities, I try to buy the utilities that have the lowest amounts of debt. I'm always conscious about debt. Having a company in one's portfolio with only this amount of debt is fabulous. So this is something I love about 3M. Let's keep going. I started looking just at their um, 10Ks. The 10K is the annual report. I think for 3M, it only lists five years of data. So I looked not only at the 2017 annual report, but I went back to the 2012 to get some more prior data as well. And what I did then is I was able to pull 2007 versus 2017. I really want to look kind of at like a 10 year period. And the reason I'm doing this is I just did a video on Johnson & Johnson. I'm going to link in the video or the description below. I did a similar analysis. And so I felt like this would be an opportunity to do a similar analysis. I think 10 years is a good amount of time to look at. Revenue went from 24.4 billion to 31.6 billion. This is a growth rate of 29%. 29% dividend or um, revenue growth rate over a 10 year period. That's fabulous for a world established, world class established company like 3M. So I was happy with that. Also operating income went from 6.19 billion to 7.8 billion, an increase of 26%. I love that. Both the revenue and the operating income are scaling, they're growing. And the operating margins are really strong. They were 25.3% in 2007 to 24.7% in 2017. So down a little bit, but I actually like this. I put a note here, I actually like this. A lot of companies as of late have been plagued with flat revenues and They've been growing earnings per share by doing all kinds of things. They've been buying back shares, and don't get me wrong, 3M does that too, but they've also been cutting costs. They've been streamlining costs. They've been um, just becoming more efficient, and that's a good thing, but at the same time, you can only squeeze so much efficiency. At a certain point, revenue has to grow. What I like about this company, just at a high level, is these numbers indicate not a lot of cost cutting. In fact, the margins are, um, are shrinking a little bit. They've been investing in their costs. They've been investing in research and development. They've been investing in their sales force, their marketing team. They've been going full steam ahead to grow revenue. And while they're growing revenue, the profits have been growing as well. And so the reason I like seeing this is it's a little bit different than what I've seen out there with other companies. That being said, we're gonna to get to this later. If this is a 10 year period, most of this revenue growth happened in the first five years. When one looks at the last five years, revenue growth is only up 3%. And 
That's okay because I, I believe that most companies kind of go in cycles, even non-cyclical companies. There's cycles to revenue growth. There's a new product launch. There's some new, uh, some, some new technology that comes out. There are cycles. And so the revenue is not going to be so, so consistent for most companies every year. But 10 years, I always like to see some strong revenue growth. And I see that, so that's really good. And I like the fact that they're not going overboard on the cost cutting. I think some of the other companies out there, they have cut the costs and they've cut the cost as much as they can. And they're at the point where they can't cut more. They need the revenue to grow, to grow the business. But the beauty of something like this, just at a high level, is there's probably some room to cut costs if they want to. And so if they ever do run into some challenges with revenue growth, they've got a little bit left to keep pushing forward, to keep pushing forward on that operating income and ultimately the earnings per share growth. So I'm really excited about that. So I want to move down this chart. To close out today, I want to look just at some high level pros and cons with this investment. As with any investment, there are pros and cons. My favorite pro is this thing is down. It's down 25% since its peak. And this is only on um, this year in 2018, it's dropped this much since its peak, I think in January. This is a good correction for this company. Why is it down? I think it's down because people are concerned about what I just said. The revenue is only up 3% in the last five years. And in fact, in their latest quarterly earnings report, they mentioned that their EPS range was going to be a little lower, I think, than they, they had previously um, disclosed and nothing inconsequential but you know how the analysts are we've talked about this on my video before and how people get so hyped up in the short run when it comes to the stock market but we know as dividend growth investors that that is not the the way to go it's better to look at the long run and let this short-term noise create buying opportunities and so i'm excited when I see something like this, because I view it as a potential buying opportunity. And like I've said, I've not really seen 3M correct too much more than this other than during the Great Recession. What else? The dividend. The dividend is up 114% in five years time. Five years. I don't see that very often with a company of this size. And in fact, the payout ratio, look at this guys, I didn't put it on here, but let's just look at this really quickly. The payout, the, they're paying out right now 544 per share in dividends per year. This year, 2018, that's what's going to happen. In 2018, they're earning between 1020 and 1070. Let's just say it's 1020. If you take 544, you divide by 10, 1020, this is just over 50%. Their payout ratio is in that 50, 55% range. It's just over 50%. This is a really good payout ratio, and this means they can continue to increase the dividend. So the fact of the matter is, is not only have they increased it 114% in the last five years, they actually just increased it 16% just now, just recently. I think potentially it could continue because the payout ratio is low, the revenues are growing, the earnings are growing, the company is doing well, and that's just rare with a company, rare with a company this size, 114 billion, rare with a disruption-proof company, rare with one that has all these products, and um, I like that about 3M. What else? Organic growth. Take the time, take the time to go to their investor relations website, read their annual report for 2017. It will be quite encouraging. When I look at their business by geography, all across the world, when I look at their business by business unit, by operating segment, there's something consistent there. Organic sales growth is up across all of them. And what does organic mean? Organic means it's growth that was generated within the company. It wasn't through mergers and acquisitions. And it wasn't due to like currency fluctuations and just anomalies with currencies. It's all normalized. Organic growth, it's up across the board. And I couldn't find one segment or one country where there wasn't any growth. There was one where it was kind of minimal growth, but that's rare. That's rare that they're firing on all cylinders and they're seeing that growth like it, especially in this economy, because this isn't the best economy right now when it comes to blue chip stocks. And we've done some of these videos on consumer staples. And a lot of these companies right now, they're plagued with growth. They're plagued with some growth. And so the fact that they're doing it is, um, is great. What else do I like about them? They um, have 55,000 plus products. One report I saw said 60,000. That's just phenomenal. Um, diversification. We already talked about that. Recession roof. What else I like about this company is if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I own 37 stocks, but you also know I'm heavily skewed towards consumer non-cyclical. 
this is not a consumer company. This is an industrial company. This, if I were to buy it in my portfolio, would help me diversify. That's important. I like to diversify because I don't want to be too skewed in any one sector. Yes, I just don't know what will happen. And when it comes time to live off of dividends, the last thing I need is risk. I want stability and I build a winning team, a portfolio of winning companies. It's always good to pepper in some industrials. And I do own some industrials, but I don't own this one yet. And so I like that about 3M. Let's move over to the cons. Let's look at the cons. I highlight this one. Only 3% growth in the revenue in the last five years. Is that cause for concern? Not yet. But if it's, if it's only like 3% over 10 years, let's say the revenue starts plateauing, it would not warrant a starting yield so low. And it would also indicate that they'd have less propensity probably to grow the dividend in the long, long run. Short run, they're fine because this payout ratio is so good. But long, long run, it would be difficult. And so they need to get their revenue growing a little quicker. I realize it's a little lumpy with 3M. It comes in, in surges and that's fine but just something to cause for concern. Another cause for concern. This uh, company is based out of the United States. A lot of these products that they make, one could imagine that they'd make them in China for cheaper. They are constantly in competition with others around the world and in, in countries where it may be cheaper to, to do these, this kind of innovation. And so it might be a lot less overhead, less uh, management overhead better cost structures. And so I'm sure they outsource globally, but I'm just saying running a company out of the US is a little bit more expensive than running a company out of China. That said, they have the brand name, they have the history. This company has been in business over 100 years. They have the intellectual property, the patents, etc. So that's all, that's all uh, good stuff, but it's just something to remember that there's fierce competition with the industry that they're in. And it's um, most likely fierce competition with countries like China. What else? They need to reinvent and innovate. I was reading an interesting article on this company. Even within the last 10 years, they had to reinvent how the uh, post-it note, the, the adhesive on it is uh, formulated. And the reason for that is there are government agencies out there, environmental agencies that want to make sure that the, the chemicals and the products that are, be, that are being used in the 3M products and other companies like 3M are the right thing. They're safe, they're the right one. And these standards, they're always changing over time because as science progresses, there's new findings that are discovered. And so 3M is being challenged from time to time to reinvent certain products that already exist. So they're having to pour more money in to products that already exist. And so that's um, that could be expensive over time. And also they just need to reinvent because over time, there's probably a life cycle to some of their products and they always need to innovate. This is a company that's founded on innovation. So for example, they're, they're films. They make films for screens, for screens for electronics. I imagine 10 years from now, the, the electronics that we use are going to be completely different than the electronics of today. Contrasting with something like Procter Gamble, I imagine 10 years from now, I'm going to be using the same bounty paper towels that I use today. There doesn't need to be innovation. A paper towel is a paper towel. Maybe there's some innovation there, like they went from the big sheets to the smaller, make it more efficient. Um, that was a cool innovation. But the fact of the matter is, is with something like LCD screens with the films that go on them, there's probably going to be a lot of innovation there. And so not only is 3M reinventing itself on existing products, but they need to innovate. Thankfully, they're pouring a ton of money into research and development. They always have. They continue to up it each year. I love that. That's one of the reasons I love that their operating margin is actually down um, because during this time, they could have squeezed out more earnings if they wanted to. They didn't because they know that they have to reinvest in the company, and I love that. Because this company is not just about all of these products that they build, it's about innovation. And it's funny because this is kind of considered an industrial, but they brand themselves almost as a tech company, as an innovation company. And I think there's some truth to that, that they need to keep innovating. And I think from putting even this con aside, I like that because I could use more exposure to tech. I, I certainly have some but I could use more. And it's not a pure play tech company, but certainly there's some element of technology, innovation, and science behind this company that I love. So that's my take on 3M today. I think the high, high level is I really like it. I've historically avoided it because of the starting yield has always been lower than what I typically do. Um, that said, this analysis here fully proves that <laughs> I shouldn't be, be I sh in my situation, I shouldn't get caught up in the starting yield. Some people who are investing who might e need the yield tomorrow, maybe they should get 
caught up in that starting yield because this might not serve the needs of someone who needs income tomorrow, but for me it doesn't. I think one other thing worth noting that I think is a meta level concept. I own 37 stocks. I don't own 3M yet. I probably, I, I, I'm seriously considering averaging into this one at this point, and I, I may very well do that. So in terms of full disclosure, I'm probably going to buy this. The interesting thing, though, is there will always be stocks that one is missing. I could own, I own 37 now. I could own 50, and I could still come across another 3M. There are always these, these jewels that are out there, these hidden gems that kind of pop up. And that's the fun thing about being a dividend investor, but it's also a risk. One does not want to get too many positions. One does not want to diversify and have too many positions, whereas there's too much overhead and it's confusing to manage it all. In my opinion, this is certainly not diversifying. This is one of the best companies out there. It's just I always thought it was too expensive. And the fact of the matter is, if I go from 37 positions to 38, it's not the end of the world. I can live with that. Given the size of my portfolio now, I can I can shoulder that many positions. I'm fine with that. And in fact, I like having more positions because it smooths out it smooths everything out when it comes time to live off of dividends and it reduces risk. That said, I don't want to have so many positions that I have inconsequential positions. So if I do buy this, which I probably will, I have to bring it up to at least 1% of the portfolio or it's just not going to be meaningful. It's not going to make sense. But the meta level point here is if you have a dividend portfolio and you're thinking about which positions to add, sometimes one can kind of get compulsive and they could be like, wow, that's great. I need to buy it. Or that's great. I need to buy it. Sometimes it's not the right thing to buy it, even if there are hidden gems because of limiting just portfolio number of positions to something manageable. But for me, this is probably enough of a hidden gem here and it's had enough of a correction where I, and it has enough of a dividend growth history where I really like it and I may, I may very well go for it. But it's, it's that constant debate that will go on in one's mind as a dividend investor. And at a meta level, there's no one right answer. There's going to be people out there who have portfolios with 50 stocks or even more, and that works for them. There's going to be people out there who have portfolios with maybe only five stocks, and that works for them. Big portfolios even. And so for me, I'm kind of in the middle. I skew on the on the bigger side. I have more positions. I'm working hard to keep it limited. And I, so I always have to remember and remind myself not to have too many positions. But when one like this comes up, one has to look really seriously. So. Thank you for watching. Before I leave today, just a full disclosure, I own the companies I mentioned, most of the companies I mentioned in this uh, this video. Not this one yet, but I probably will. So uh, full disclosure though, the ones I mentioned that I already own are Johnson & Johnson, ticker symbol J&J, &J, Procter & Gamble, ticker symbol PG, and also Southern Company, ticker symbol SO. And I will probably be buying 3M, ticker symbol MMM, uh, sometime soon. And um, in terms of a disclaimer, I am not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video is not investment advice. This video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone has taken the time to subscribe, to like, to comment. The comments fuel the videos, and this one was directly off of a comment, so or several comments, so I really appreciate that. If you have any requests, please put them in the description below. If you have a spare minute, if you could subscribe or like the video, it really means the world to me. It helps me grow the channel, helps me keep producing quality videos like this one, and um, delivering value to the dividend growth com uh, investing community. And I thank you. I wish all of you all of the success in the world. I will see you in the next video.